Hey there, thanks for joining me on this short video that we take in as an extract from our cost assessment course where we were looking at the exposure um, controls and personal protection. So really what this looks at is workplace exposure limits. So we thought it might be valuable for you as a bit of a short explainer. It's only five minutes. Um, it might give you a bit more of an insight into what the WELs are. So let's have a look. Now we're on to invariably one of the most important sections in our safety data sheet and that is section 8 which covers exposure controls and personal protection. This part can get a bit technical but we'll walk through some examples and show you how you may want to use the information as part of your chemical risk assessment. We'll start by using our main example of sodium hypochlorite here and then move from there. The first subsection looks at control parameters. Hmm, but what the heck does that mean? Really what this first section should provide us with is to let us know if there's any exposure limits for any of the harmful ingredients within the product. To run over that again, many of our hazardous substances will be assigned with workplace exposure limits or WELs. This is where a material has been identified as a significant health hazard and the relevant authorities have assigned and tested how much the human body can tolerate without a negative health impact. What are we talking about when we mention exposure in this sense? Well, exposure is the uptake of the substance into the body. The main exposure routes are as follows. First of all, by breathing fume, dust, gas or mist. By skin contact or by ingestion or swallowing. The workplace exposure limits are calculated on the basis of uptake into the body through the air in the form of gases, which could be fumes or vapors, and also through dusts or mists. In the case of our sodium hypochlorite, we can see here that there's no WEL that's relevant to the material in its normal state. Now, it may be argued that our sodium hypochlorite contains chlorine, which is a highly toxic gas and that it should be listed within the WELs. But we'll come back to that point shortly. As a quick comparison, if we were looking at section 8.1 for another liquid of a similar corrosive nature, such as sulfuric acid, would we expect to see anything different? Well, it turns out that sulfuric acid indeed does have its own workplace exposure limit. As you can see, this helpful STS gives us the STEL or the short term exposure limit. Our short term exposure limit relates to a 15 minute short term exposure period, whereas the TWA relates to an exposure period across the entirety of a workday, in other words, eight hours. As you can see in this example, it gives us the actual WELs for different jurisdictions, including the UK, Ireland and the EU. You may be asking yourself, why is this helpful or useful? And that is a great question. Firstly, it's good to check if there are any workplace exposure limits connected to your product. And if the answer is yes, then it's a red flag to alert you that you're dealing with something that could potentially and easily harm your workers if they're exposed to it. It's also very useful, of course, if you have already identified a need for regular air monitoring. For example, if you put in place control measures, but you're still worried that there might be a significant risk of exposure to the harmful agent due to the variability in the work. In that case, the WELs become the key point of reference for measuring the effectiveness of your control measures. In the same way, the WEL value can be useful if you wanted to, for example, take a one-off measurement just to quantify that your control measures are actually working and effective. As a side note, for those responsible for environmental protection, you may want to keep your eye out for the predicted no effect concentration figure, which is very similar to the WEL, but of course it's for the environmental protection side of things. Okay, let's move on to the next subsection, and this is an important one, and that is personal protection. It's in this section that we can usually find the specifics on how we actually go about preventing harm from the substance, and that includes the use of hopefully engineering measures and personal protective equipment. Like most things, the quality of the SDS itself does vary from supplier to supplier, but let's look at some good examples of what you might expect to see here. For this example, we're going to revert back to our example safety data sheet for sulfuric acid. To start, we can see a really nice example of engineering measures to prevent exposure as a first step. As the hierarchy of control and health and safety suggests, engineering measures are certainly a preferred and more effective control method than that of PPE. 
In this case, it's recommending that this product should only be handled in an area that has LEV or local exhaust ventilation. This is targeted mechanical ventilation that removes the hazard before someone can be exposed to it and it can be taken up into the body. They also advise that processes using the substance should be isolated or enclosed. In other words, they want you to minimize the risk of contact or exposure to the sulfuric acid, which makes sense. This SDS also mentions some useful tips on emergency response, citing the availability of things like eyewash stations and emergency showers in the work area. As I'm sure you'll agree, when you get this type of information in the SDS, it is really helpful, and particularly for those that have less experience in managing hazardous substances. Thanks for watching this short video from safety.com on workplace exposure limits. Hopefully it was helpful for you, and if you did find it helpful, please do let us know, and we'll, uh, we'll make sure to look out for more opportunities to give you short versions on specific topics like this. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.